Okay. All right. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Isabel Kent and this is the second uh, IG Live conversation in a new series that I'll be doing for Athena Art Foundation. Athena is a new non-profit digital platform promoting engagement with pre-modern art. Its main platform is its website, which is a hub that presents digital uh, innovative content about exhibitions, podcasts and other resources like that. It also creates original content, including this series of interviews, and I'm so excited to be working with Athena. And today's guest is the fabulous Jonquil O'Reilly. Jonquil is Vice President and Head of Sales and a Senior Specialist in Old Masters at Christie's New York. As well as being an expert in the Old Masters and particularly in the Italian Renaissance, Jonquil has a passion for fashion, both historic and contemporary, and she's written extensively on the ways in which we can look at art and decode art through the fashion of the time. And she wrote a column on this very topic for Harper's Bazaar. She's also worked with numerous contemporary designers and artists, organising collaborations such as the exhibition last year with Gareth Pugh, the fashion designer, and a recent collaboration with the artist Volker Hermes. Uh, Jonquil is such a font of knowledge and is really a fabulous communicator, so I'm so excited to be talking with her today. So I'm going to now add her to the live. All right. Hello to everyone arriving. Hi, John Quill, how are you doing? Hello, uh, thank you for that very generous um, uh, introduction. I don't think I've ever been called a font of knowledge before, so that's, uh, that's one I'll add. So. Well, that's accurate, <laughs> <In my bio>. but... <laughs> And how are you doing? I'm, I'm loving the background. It's much, much more colourful than my uh, my white walls. I don't know. I was very into your Spanish fans that you had um, yesterday. Actually, oh, they're still there. Good, good. Yes, if still I there. in any other direction, you'll see nothing but um, toddlers, Wendy houses, um, <laughs> and <laughs> a small square. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I imagine I'm, I'm, it's impressive. You've got a, a moment of quiet as well to, to do this live. So thanks so much for for no, being no, here and for taking no, the time. No, no, no. And, and I should ask sort of where in the world are you? Because of course, you know, doing these things online, it's always nice to, to get a sense of that. Of course, I'm um, in my uh, living room in Brooklyn. Um, so I live in New York. I've been here for about 10 years, but I'm originally from the UK, obviously. Obviously. It's nice to be talking with a, with a fellow Brit and, uh, <laughs> and, yeah, and the British accent. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'm really excited. So the first, the first sort of thing that I wanted to talk about, because so much of your, you know, your art and the videos that you've, that you've made and all of these different projects that you've worked on show the way in which you look at art in this really unusual and really exciting way. And you kind of, you know, certainly for me as, as, a, as a viewer of that content, you sort of bring us along, along for the ride. So I wondered we could start um, with sort of talking about uh, how you started being interested in this and then maybe having an example of a, of a specific painting that you feel really represents the way that you can sort of see so much more by having this having this knowledge of historic fashion. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, if we sort of start as to how I, I got into it, it's, um, in honesty, it was completely by accident. And I think that it does affect the way that I look at art because I, I came from thinking that it wasn't really for me, that um, uh, you needed to um, have a PhD and you needed to sort of be, uh, you know, have this whole sort of background of knowledge in order to look at some of these things or enjoy some of these things. And um, so I sort of fell into old masters um, uh, via my first job, uh, which was at Sotheby's. And I, I took a job as a PA. And when I applied for it, I didn't actually know where it was. I didn't even know it was at an auction house. Um, and so um, when I got down to the final rounds and it turned out it was in Old Masters, that was where I, um, where I started getting into paintings and, mm. and really through studying what we had on the walls, studying the catalogues, and I completely fell in love with them. But I think the fact that I came not from an art background um, 
meant that I could see how I always had in the back of my mind how intimidating the art world could be how quite a lot of things were presented in a way that weren't didn't feel accessible and I think quite often the people in the art world producing these things didn't actually know that the material they were producing or the exhibitions that they were putting on things weren't necessarily accessible to to the majority of them. Um, so that was what I always kept in mind as I sort of became a cataloger and then um, you know a specialist and if whether it's writing catalogue notes or um, or you know writing articles or giving lectures I always think about you know, who the audience is and sort of those you know, the classic um, uh, exam answer that your teacher used to tell you, you know, imagine that you're explaining this to somebody who is very intelligent but just doesn't happen to know this area and that's that's what you always have to keep in mind that you're you're keeping things as, as open as possible and for as many people to enjoy as possible yeah yeah for sure and I think the way that you um, yeah, the way that you write, I was just before starting this live, I was rereading some of your uh, old columns in Harper's Bazaar, <coughs> thinking it's so kind of captivating and it's so, you know, exciting. And as you say, bring someone along for the ride. And I mean, I am certainly no expert in historic fashion, but you really immediately um, make one feel sort of safe, I suppose, in this new wheelhouse, in this, in this new sphere of, of knowledge and, and information. I think that's really amazing. And that kind of connects, I think, with how, the, how your writing about this started. Is that right? Because where did this uh, sort of writing yeah, come from? Yes, well, it came originally from, um, uh, from the intranet. <laughs> um, uh, I um, got into a, a bit of a slumber to reach that point where I was I was a junior specialist but I, I couldn't really see how I could get to the to the next bit and I I I'd, I'd quite frankly lost a lot of confidence and um and I thought well what is it that um that I really love and what um you know what do I want to to study more and what will what will help me and so I thought well if I just say to myself I made a new year's resolution that I was going to study historical fashion and um because I found it really interesting I thought, well you know I know what I'm like if I just say uh, I have to study then nothing's going to happen so like, I need to quantify this and so I said right I will take you know um an afternoon or um uh you know um a weekend um I, but I have to do it two days a week you know an evening or a, or a weekend day and um, and then every six weeks I have to write an article and that way I've got a deadline for myself. And I was like, right, I'll write an article about historical fashion. I'll choose a different garment each time. And so I started writing for this, um, for the intranet, because I thought, obviously, no one reads the intranet. And <laughs> so it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I thought the people that do look at it are, you know, quite a lot of people who, who've joined auction houses and might be in the... Um, Hey, the people who work at the front desk or the people who work in the shipping department and you'd think that by working in an auction house you'd have all this connection to art but the reality is there are a lot of jobs within the auction world where you, you then end up not really getting as much um uh, as much access to the art as you would like so i thought well this is great no one's going to read it except these people and um and i'll just aim it at those people the people who you know in their lunch break could go to um, one of the exhibitions um, in the galleries, um, but who otherwise might not, you know, have um, have the access. And but it, it turned out somebody, unfortunately for me, from the press department read it, and <laughs> <laughs> so then sort of put it out. Or maybe you want to get a job to write for the magazine. So I started writing for the magazine, and then somehow, and quite frankly, I still don't really know how it happened. Um, it ended up being syndicated by Harper's Bazaar, and so I had this regular column there, and. And it was really fun just being able to, I found if you, if you make people laugh, then um, it, it's immediately disarming. And so if you can, if you can say it is okay to laugh at some of these portraits, because frankly, it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, and then you point out lots of details of, of fashion details. You're then, you know, instead of explaining just one painting, mm. you're, you're giving people keys that they can apply to loads of different paintings. And particularly for some of the more difficult ones, I think I even sort of <laughs> managed to convert myself. I'd always found powdered wigs and you know, um, 18th century portraiture a little bit, oof, you know, it's never really my thing. 
But through studying you know, powdered wigs and studying the cut of some of these gentlemen's coats, and suddenly I actually converted myself. I was like, oh, I see these are quite good. <laughs> Interesting. So when you tell somebody about a powdered wig and how heavy it might be, how you how you look after it, um, where the hair comes from, all these kinds of things. And the next time somebody walks into, you know, say those rooms in the National Portrait Gallery in London that where all the Kit Kat Club guys are, and they all essentially look exactly the same and they've all got the same wig, slightly different shade. And normally you step in and like, oh, God, that's a bit, you know. But instead, suddenly you're like, oh, uh, you know, it, it, there are all these little things that, that you've learned that you can apply to these paintings and it makes them much more accessible and you can you can look at them for a bit longer and you can engage with them. And before you know it, when you look at things more closely and spend more time with things, you're developing your eye. And then it, it sort of, it has this knock on effect, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, and it's funny, you know, you saying about not initially thinking that you liked these things or maybe just <laughs> not liking them initially. And then, you know, the more you delve into them, the more you find new lenses through which to look at art, which, the more you realise, okay, there's so much here, there's so much that's exciting here. And, you know, just access into that moment in time, but also into the, you know, the, the work of art themselves and all of these different, these different sorts of avenues. I mean, I certainly felt that it's funny with the 18th century sort of French thing, um, previously working, uh, you know, previously working at the Wallace and thinking, you know, getting there and I was mostly into, into Baroque art and, and Renaissance and thinking, oh, this, all this yeah. Yeah. porcelain, it's Proof. all <laughs> And now, I mean, I have such time for surf porcelain. I never thought of myself as a kind of cute, sort of gilded, you know, sort of gilded. You're there, you're laced into one of those powder blue gowns. <laughs> yeah, now I'm just, yeah. All, all, all the get up. No, it's 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 amazing, and I need to go back to that room in the in the NPG in the National Portrait Gallery because I I, I have been avoiding it for such a long time because I remember going. <laughs> this is just not not my not my wheelhouse not my cup of tea but now i'm going to go back and think how uncomfortable and uh, <laughs> those wigs must have been samuel peeps and how long it took him to decide to uh, actually shave his head and and yeah. wear wig, and how worried he was about wearing it to court would people think he was a little bit stupid but then other people <laughs> were wearing them but then he actually quite liked his own hair he didn't really want to shave it off because really it looked quite good but all these little things are, are, are things that you can keep in mind when you're looking at these um, things and I wonder when, when you said upkeep, I was just thinking, God, I would not have the patience to do all the upkeep on a wig. Would I be one of the scruffy guys in that painting with my wig? <laughs> like, you were not done up as nicely. I definitely would. I definitely I'd probably be one of the ones that had one of the sort of straw ones or the horse hair ones. <laughs> I mean, you say that but every single time that I see you, you are in, you are just looking so on point. Um, so, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> In person is he <laughs> so yeah on on this on this sort of topic of like seeing seeing the art differently i wonder in that in your explorations when you were doing this writing were there was there a particular i mean is there a particular work that jumps out to you right now that you just think that was so so cool the way the way in which you know by digging into this lens you were able to yeah see so much more i think um one of the sort of watershed moments i had with this was, um, uh, there's a portrait of uh, what's presumed to be uh, Lady Snackenborg, I think is how you pronounce it. I've only ever seen it written, so I don't know. Um, in the, um, uh, it's in Tate, Britain. And she was um, Elizabeth I's um, lady in waiting, but one of her, sort of, she was her right-hand woman, essentially. And she was one of the, the chief mourners at her funeral. But she joined Elizabeth's retinue when she was really, really young. And basically this portrait had sort of forever been um, unidentified and um, one particular scholar just pieced together everything that she was wearing you know, noted that she had these Tudor roses um, of different you know, she had both the white ones and the red ones in her sleeves and in her hair they noticed that she had um, uh, a little um, uh, oak leaf tucked behind her ear 
which was uh, the symbol of the house of, um, gosh, I'm forgetting now, of course, the, um, the name of the Lord that she'd been having a long standing affair with, but couldn't marry because he had divorced when divorce had been um, uh, permitted under Henry VIII and then <laughs> was technically still married when it was reversed. And so, um, and then she's wearing this um, jewel that for the date of the painting is really outdated. It's you know, about sort of 30 years out of date. Um, but it corresponds with Holbein's sketch for a jewel that um, uh, that this nobleman had um, had designed first, casually for his first wife, but presumably she didn't need it anymore. Um, and so she's wearing you know, a jewel that looks almost exactly, it's sort of a figural thing, so it's almost exactly the same. And there were just all these these little notes in it that point to who she was. And I think... Um, it for so long historical fashion has been you know looked down upon by art historians has you know been seen very much as secondary which is absurd when you think of how important it was for these sitters at the time and so reading this um this article it just i remember being so excited and um so when i, I was part of a, um, a piece for Harper's Bazaar and they wanted to photograph me with one of my favourite paintings and they said, you know, and I said, it's, it's got to be Lady Snakes, it's got to be Lady Snakenborg. And so the photographer had me posed, Jermaine Francis is his name, he's an excellent photographer, had me posed um, with my fingers interlaced in the same way that she has it, obviously some really awkward. <laughs> um, and the man must be a genius because trying to photograph me um, at eight o'clock in the morning in a gallery um, meant, oh, of course, I couldn't stop laughing. And he just managed to get in between. But I think that that painting I come back to again and again, it just reminds me of... Um, uh, of um, you know, how important clothing is, whether it's to sort of understand the um, the social standing of the sitter or you know, for identifying them. Um, and also, it's I always have a, a postcard of it on my desk because it just reminds me of um, of, a, of a bit of a lull in my career when I lost confidence and just sort of I keep that in my mind. I think you know, think about lady snakes, think about the historical fashion, think about the things that, <laughs> that keep you going. So. She, she would be my number one lady. Uh, the Athena Foundation said that they'll post a picture of her on Instagram so we can see her so we know what she looks like. Amazing. A trend and something that, that you have done a lot of work on, a lot of you know, fantastic projects on, which is looking at contemporary fashion and connecting that to uh, the old masters. And so, I mean, there's been this trend of exhibitions recently that I've noticed with the Balenciaga, which I know you uh, you did a short video about and some others. So I wondered if you could sort of talk a little bit about about this and what's exciting about it for you as a as a specialist. Yeah, of course. I think um, it's it started before the the link with the contemporary fashion. It started with a couple of exhibitions about historical fashion, which proved that people were genuinely interested and that you could pull people into museums by you know connecting this fashion idea i think for a long time people have been seeing you know the major successes that the vna have with their um sort of you know, massive fashion exhibitions every year likewise with you know the institute at the met um and i think the the this sort of mega landmark at least for me um was um uh Anna Reynolds exhibition at the Queen's Gallery called In Fine Style, which was about um, Tudor and Stuart fashion. And it was just a game changer. And I think it, it really, really was one of the first exhibitions that managed to um, actually get art historians <laughs> to pay attention to historical fashion and be taken seriously. And I think, I think it was the second most visited exhibition at the Queen's Gallery, second only to Leonardo, or maybe it's Michelangelo. And frankly, you know, if it's any of the Ninja Turtles, you can't compete. That, that doesn't count. Um, I feel like it was a good rule of thumb. Yeah. Except um, Donald, And I think to then they were... Compete against Donald. Yeah, you're right, actually. He's, you know, um, he only does machines. Um, if I remember the song correctly. Uh, so it's, I think then there was an exhibition at the Met, which was um, uh, looking at you know, slightly more 19th century fashion, looking at um, uh, fashion in the Impressionists. Um, and frankly, that's a bit easier because obviously there's loads more surviving garments. So, you know, technically that's cheating. But I think people then started to see this connection and that you could 
people to come and look at old masters if you link them with um, fashion and then if you started to link them with contemporary fashion. So, um, I mean, the Balenciaga and Spanish paintings exhibition, um, which was um, at the Thyssen Museum, was it, I mean, I walked in, they were still, still sort of doing all the final drilling and hammering and all this kind of thing to, for the installation the day before um, when we went into film um, with the curator Eloy, who was just divine. And it was genuinely breathtaking and it was a genuine dialogue. And I think when, when, whenever you do these things and whenever museums choose to do these things or when, whenever I'm writing, you know, even on a sort of small scale, when you're linking historical fashion or paintings to um, contemporary fashion, you can't push anything or force anything. If it's not genuine, it doesn't work. And um, whereas something like Balenciaga was amazing because he genuinely did go to the Prado every week to look at um, to look at paintings. He genuinely was inspired um, by these um, uh, by these portraits, and and also you know, many of these portraits were owned by you know the families of his um, his own clients and his patrons so um so he was surrounded by them and i think um when you can draw these parallels i mean particularly with couture because i, I think that's the the best way to think about a lot of the the clothing in these portraits it's you know off the rack versus couture the off the rack would be what you see in the um the village scenes in a Bruegel. <laughs> you know, that's your H&M. And then the couture is what you see in these major sort of um, portraits of the nobility. And so um, I think it helps when you're looking at the embroidery, you know, how many of us spend that much time in front of couture? Not, not a lot of us, but when you can, you go to these exhibitions and see the seams, see the, um, the beadwork, see all the, you know, craftsmanship, and then you look at the paintings hanging beside them and you get a sense of what some of these fabrics would have looked like. You get a sense of the weight of them. You see the sort of codes that the artists are using to denote particular textiles and to, to sort of you know, really like, ring that bell to say, this is really expensive, this person is really important. It, it triggers lots of things and it. it really helps you to engage with the paintings, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I opportunity to see the Balenciaga show but uh, from all the installation shots it just looked so phenomenal and that connection as you say artists uh, or Balenciaga the fashion designer I think we can call him an artist uh, going there so deeply at all the works in the Prado and at these works in his clients homes it seems like such a sort of wonderful kind of concrete connection there um, and similarly there are so many fashion designers who've looked to the old masters and who've looked to uh, earlier art for inspiration so hopefully we'll be seeing you know more and more of these shows and and hopefully there aren't too many well I don't know are, th are there some that are coming around that, that, that haven't worked so well where you felt like there's a bit of a you know flaw maybe, maybe don't need to name names but I'm just thinking if you know isn't that same concrete connection because there isn't always uh, just having these two things side by side is there is there uh, use in that or is it better to kind of that hearty hearty historical connection too i think if it's um uh if it doesn't work you see it immediately and then you people aren't going to engage with it at all they're just going to come and see the fashion they're not going to look at the paintings um and so i can't think of any specific examples and i would be far too nice to say if i could <laughs> where it hasn't worked um but i can think of lots where um I can think of exhibitions that I've been to where they've been too timid and they've gone for the, the sort of aspect of it that would be um, more interesting to a contemporary audience and then they've just sort of sprinkled in a few things um, and it doesn't work. You have, to, you have to really go for it if you're going to go for it, I think. And um, if you just sort of, um, equally if you have a, you know, a paintings exhibition, then you just have sort of one or two garments. Oh, here's a little bit of lace and here's a little bit of, you know, then that's not going to work either. You have, either have to do it or not do it. Otherwise, otherwise nobody's going to bother coming again. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, and it's and it's really exciting, sort of seeing where you know seeing these exhibitions coming together in these really, as you say, these quite uh, quite brave projects. People who are actually being quite exciting in the ways in which they're thinking about. Um, oh, you just disappeared for a second, but you're back. Uh, the ways in which people are people are thinking about this are 
other ways in which you'd like to see it pushed further? I don't know, where do you see these kinds of shows uh, going? Um, I just, for me, I think it's um, understanding what people are looking for and understanding that people can digest a whole lot more than we give them credit for. I think you, um, you and I have talked certainly before about um, exhibitions that have just fallen, you know, not necessarily fashion and, and um, uh, you know, sort of textile and painting exhibitions, but painting exhibitions in general that have just missed the mark in understanding that in order to make something accessible, it doesn't mean it needs to be patronizing. Um, and I think what, what I'd like to see more of is people you know, pitching these exhibitions um, in such a way that you're, you're thinking of your audience as, you know, as we said before, as you know, an intelligent audience who just happens not to be conversant in this particular um, area of art history. And, um, but I do think there is so much more um, opportunity for dialogue with, with contemporary artists and, uh, you know, with, um, particularly with contemporary fashion designers. And, um, but I think that just sort of, you know, plonking old masters side by side with contemporary, for example, you know, we've seen quite a lot of days in the last 10 years and some of them work and some of them don't. So um, I think I'd like to see more um, paintings alongside objects, more of um, a, a dialogue between those. You know, like we saw it, the, the, I mean, the new installation was about 10 years ago now, um, at the Rice Museum, you know, where um, they brought in lots of objects so that when you're looking at paintings here particularly still lives and things you can get a sense of what the glassware looked like what the tablecloth might look like <laughs> what um you know what the what the pewter might be like so that mm -hmm. people can can really get a sense of what these textures were and what um uh what surfaces the artists were trying to um uh, you know trying to describe for the viewer as you say that sort of making tangible all of these things that we see in in paint might be um i it's it's so important i was actually just recently thinking about this because i was looking at um peter porbus's allegory of love uh, which is um has, has recently sort of changed locations actually lit um at, at the at the wallace so i was i was having a look at that and that has just a, a table not only does it have an amazing costumes as i'm sure you you know um but it has this table full of sort of Venetian uh, glass work and and as you say pewter plates and I just think that would be such a great thing to have all of these sorts of objects uh, around because the people of that, of that time would see them and know exactly what they were. Um, and this also reminds me of some work because you've you've done some work on uh, historic textiles as well with this uh, this um, textile collector. So I wondered how did that change your, your thinking? What was that experience like? Can you just talk a little bit about that, about that project you did? Of course, I, I did an exhibition with um, a, a textile collector from here in New York, um, Jill Lassison, who is um, an absolute legend and has um, uh, you know, one, of the, one of the best textile collections in private hands, frankly. Um, and she and I became friends um, uh, through quite a funny story that I'll tell you via DM but <laughs> um, she um, really generously agreed to um, lend a load of, of textiles to go with paintings and essentially because auction houses have an incredibly short turnaround so we don't know very far in advance what paintings are going to be um, in the in the exhibition or on the walls but I sent her you know, a, a PDF of the whole um, catalogue that was coming up and I said just have a look at everything and see if anything you know, sort of jumps to mind of what you might have in your collection and she came back with a whole list so what we did was create these little vignettes matching um, uh, matching bits of lace bits of sort of embroidered gloves um, what else did we have we had um, uh, gold and silver lace, we had all of these trims, we had tassels. Um, there was one still life with um, a, a sort of um, big rug, you know, a carpet over the, um, over the table and um, a set of playing cards and a, a gaming purse. And, you know, casually Jill happened to have a gaming purse, it was almost exactly the same as the painting. <laughs> and so we laid out all these little vignettes. Um, 
and I think that I, I was told I was only allowed to do 10. So I, 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 I did 20 and <laughs> I can come and take them down. They don't like them. Nobody did, so it was fine. Um, but it was, it was really fun. And then we ended up getting a write-up on the, um, you know, the first page of um, a Vogue um, online. And it was, uh, it was the weekend of, the, um, of Trump's inauguration. And I <laughs> they said, if you're, if you're not out marching and need something to distract yourself, why not go? <laughs> um, and so that, that was really, really interesting and really fun because it, it, it did give a lot of people, as you said, with these you know, um, objects and things that would have been so every day. I mean, not so every day that your average peasant would be you know, wearing these, um, these fabulous things, but you know, it, people would be used to seeing um, vestments and things in church. They would be used to seeing this fabulous embroidery um, on uh, on vestments and on um, you know on Bible covers and on hangings uh, in ecclesiastical settings if they didn't own them themselves, and so for the modern eye, it 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 really helps because you're not necessarily thinking about these textiles and things in such a three D way. Um, so we we had an absolute whale of a time. It was it was nightmarish to put together, um, uh, but Jill and I had a great time. <laughs> It, it sounds it sounds so fantastic and what a what a nice respite from from uh, from Trump's inauguration trying to take your mind off that <laughs> and, and there are some actually some great videos if, if uh, people who are watching haven't seen there's some great great sort of uh, videos on your on your own Instagram page of sort of leafing through I think I think it's different sections of velvet uh, in this collection oh, yeah. and just I mean, it's uh, incredible, you know, the, the the detail and the complexity, both in terms of the patterning, but as you say, like the texture, you know, we, the velvet that most of us come across nowadays is very different from, it's, from you exactly. know, it's historic Venetian. So dense. Really. Precisely. And so being able to show people that and we had a that were out, um, you know, that, that people could, you know, that weren't under glass, that people could sort of look at and, you um, uh, but that's the great thing. You go to you go to Jill's. You say, "Oh, you know, I've been looking at this." Oh, oh, I think I've got a, a piece of that somewhere. I just pull out a box and pull out, you know, casually, uh, twenty pieces of Tudor velvet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, sort of, it's, it's so overwhelming, it's so exciting to see and to touch <laughs> and to understand, and it changes how I look at paintings because she looks at. Um, uh, at paintings and tries to sort of match them to the textiles that she knows and I'm doing it in the opposite direction so it's it's really nice because there are lots of sort of paint effects that don't necessarily make the, the immediate sense sometimes and then suddenly you see these actual fabrics or these dyes and you think oh well that color must have degraded over time it's like no that was the color of that particular fabric and that, that was you know really difficult to achieve and it might not be the nicest color today there were certain sort of purple browns for example in the um in the 17th century that were really popular that was a bit like mm, today but because they were so expensive you know, people loved them and so to be able to see these you know surviving um, textiles and realize, oh no, that's that is exactly what this painter is trying to achieve and trying to to put across to the viewer. Yeah, it's it's fantastic, and I think there's so many occasions when I've seen historical paintings and thought just just as you, you just said, you know, oh, it must have degraded, or or oh, this must be a totally imagined, you know, uh, item, you know, type of fabric when you know multiple different colors, those those fabrics that sort of shimmer in with in multiple different colors, and just yeah. like, how, how that work yeah um, but it a shot I'm, I'm sure this, yeah ex exactly that's that's the word i was looking for i'm so <laughs> there you go shot, shot silk um yeah it's it's must have been such an exciting exciting project to put together and you also you also have worked with uh, contemporary artists so i know you did the work with gareth pew so i wondered if we could yeah touch on that for a little bit and talk about sort of how did that project come about and yeah Yes, uh, uh, well, um, Gareth is, uh, uh, it was in 2020, so it was at the London Fashion Week um, for um, autumn 2020 when runway shows weren't exactly <laughs> um, to a penny. Um, and he had created um, uh, essentially a visual album as his, um, uh, for his um, collection. 
and it was mm. 12 looks i think and um he had uh still shots of them by nick knight which were incredible and um and then a sort of individual digital vignette of each and um, uh it, sort of digital rendering of each um uh by john emony and then um sort of fairly last minute he said that he he it had suddenly occurred to him that you know these um these garments were so sculptural in themselves and so interesting that it'd be really nice to be able to show them and kind of sort of put them in an art setting like an installation and so he um essentially he called and said you do you know of any any galleries that might be available and i i said you know it's, it's <laughs> I might know of a couple. I said, but let me check at Christie's first because you, there might. It's unlikely, but there might just be a space. And um, and it turned out there was. There was a gallery free in London Fashion Week. And so, in the space of a couple of weeks, um, we managed to pull together this exhibition. I mean, and Gareth's team were incredible. And um, and obviously, I I didn't get to go unfortunately because I was stuck in New York and it was you couldn't travel yet, so I didn't get to see it in person. But um, but he really sweetly walked me through <laughs> on his phone a couple of times. And um, but that that was really fun because somebody like Gareth genuinely looks at. Um, at art history and and is inspired by art historical um art historical fashion and inspired by by paintings and um although he's quite sort of careful to say it's not um there aren't necessarily direct lines between you know some of the garments as much as i draw them because i see things but it's, yeah. it's in talking to him it's always really interesting the things that i see that you know oh, that looks exactly like this you know sort of 16th century gown shape or that's you know that looks just like a piece called belly yeah. and and he's oh, actually i was i wasn't looking at that i was looking at a 19th century painting but <laughs> looking at the pre-raphaelites oh, oh okay um so it's really interesting to see what what you as the viewer project and i think also to him it's quite important that he doesn't sort of explain away his um his own um thought processes because it's it is about how the um you know, the viewer responds to his work themselves and you don't want to color that too much with um with the artist process which which i really respect yeah yeah for sure and it's and it's funny that you you were saying pointing out the different things that you noticed in these artworks because when i was looking Looking through, and that absolutely, like, absolutely spectacular uh, object, artwork, item, fashion, they do I mean, immediately. It brings to mind different sort of things that I have in my in my catalogue of, of images, and and different sort of connections, whether it's to do with sort of historic armour or, or paintings or whatever it might be. But you're right; it doesn't necessarily have to you know correspond to that but it's it's funny as well our the different knowledge that you bring to these things uh therefore that the, then it will translate into the different things you see you see in them but that's nice that he leaves it somewhat open for for people to to discover he isn't too kind of hard and fast with his uh his his sort of inspirations telling everyone what his yeah. inspirations are yeah yeah no it's it's uh fabulous and the other project that you've done really recently is is the one with with uh, Volker Hermes, the artist, uh, which I also wanted to touch upon. I mean, there are so many of these. So I have I have this whole list of, <laughs> of, of different projects that I was looking into and just thinking, oh, that's so cool. Like, that's so exciting. We could talk about that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Volker Hermes one, the, those images are just so just deliciously appealing i really love his his works and um yeah they're, they're, it's such a fabulous project you did so i wondered if you could talk a bit more a bit more about that yeah of course i mean again like the project with gareth i mean um you know i can't really take any credit for it because <laughs> volker is just an absolute force um his work is incredible um and i think on the on the face of it i think he, people sort of um got to know him on a on a wider scale during the pandemic because of you know sort of some of the th things he'd done with masks but actually he's been doing this work for you know about I think more than a decade and um looking at just covering certain parts of of the face in these historical portraits to draw attention to um uh, to other aspects, you know, particularly to the fashion and and also to just sort of shift the viewer's perspective 
when they're looking at it. So um, I think you know, quite often modern audiences look at portraits and are tempted just to sort of look at the, the faces and see how sort of photorealistic they are and, and that kind of thing. And um, he, he blocks that entry point so he makes you uh you know approach the painting from a different um a different perspective um so that is is really interesting to me and i i love um the the way he approaches each work of art um completely differently and um he uh when i sort of approached him and asked him if he would consider working um with us one of our sales he was so generous and then um he was incredibly generous with his time he was unbelievably efficient which is not how artists are supposed to be <laughs> and he produced work just so much fun and um it took a little bit of persuading to get some members of my department on board um uh, for reasons that are unclear but um our sculpture department and our 19th century department leapt at it and it would particularly our, our, our sculpture specialist they said you know he can choose anything he wants to work on and Volker said you know I'd, I'd love to but sculpture is actually incredibly difficult because it's 3d and so to make it um yeah actually work and not be distracting and to you know sort of um uh, look as though it was intended like that he said it can be really really time consuming and really hard um, and then you know he just produced a couple that were absolutely amazing <laughs> about to say one of the ones that is just totally breathtaking is that is that bust of the of the young woman I, we should we should explain for anyone who hasn't come across Volker's work uh, what he photo is it, it's right it's sort of type of kind of photoshopping to cover parts of the face of the artwork is that a sort of decent description yeah i think it's more technical than photoshop but i don't know the the vocabulary it for it. so i think it's a good of um uh of images of old masters and um and of um of sculpture and things yes and then he he'll take he never adds anything that isn't already in the painting so he'll take the the trim of a gown and make that into a headdress or he'll sort of move the waistline or you know um uh, you know change the the shape of a ruff or maybe bring a ruff all the way up to here so you can only see the eyes and um it they're they're almost always um uh humorous but in a way that's completely respectful and then for each one, if you read his captions and, and his uh, his choices for why he's done what he's done and, and how he's approached it, it's it's always really interesting. And so it's um, it was an absolute joy working with him. He's uh, you know he's incredibly talented, um, and uh, uh, and you know uh, but also um, an absolute joy <laughs> to work with. Amazing. So this is the this is the Volker Hermes Appreciation Club because I, I yeah. think his work is that is absolutely fab. And yeah, and this project with Christie's it was just yeah it was it was so brilliant and so humorous. And I saw the sh I, I'm sure a lot of people watched have seen the pictures sort of shared all over uh, social media because they, they yeah they were just yeah. fab. And as, as you say, those ones of sculpture um, if they really were incredibly difficult, which I mean, it makes total sense that they would be, but they they just come across brilliantly. So. Yeah, it's uh, you're able to you know do projects like that, and I think these things are you know finding new, new then new apps from which people can kind of think about think about the old masters because as a lot of people have that immediate uh, feeling that the old masters is maybe not for them or not something that you can engage in because it's whether it's sort of you don't feel like you have the connoisseurial, you know, quote unquote connoisseurial knowledge to be able to sort of weigh in on an artist's handling or whatever it might be with these different avenues and these different lenses. Uh, it's, yeah, new ways of, of uh, getting about this stuff and an enticing curiosity. And this is something that we've we talked quite a lot about uh, on other occasions is this, this joy and, and something that comes across in everything that, that you do, John Quill, in, in all of your work, whether it's your, uh, your videos or your, or your Instagram or your, <laughs> you know, your uh, collaborations in Christie's, is this sort of enticing of curiosity that is, that is drawn out in people because you have such a, yeah, such a passion and such a, and hopefully that can just happen more and more and more people can get excited by, by this material. That wasn't a quest, it's just a, a <laughs> 
admiration towards what you <laughs> no i think it's um that's that's the key i think it's it's our responsibility as you know, as specialists in the auction houses as dealers as curators as scholars um to, to just help people engage and to help give people access and to um, and to make sure that not all of this you know, that, that our, our world doesn't feel intimidating and that you can just dip your toe in and dip it out again and you don't need to have a huge background to enjoy things you also don't need to you know dive you know as deeply into these things as as we do because you know it happens to be how we feel about them and it happens to be our our lifelong passion but um or at least my start in my early 20s um <laughs> it it can be something that you do just you do just dip into and enjoy because you're able to to look at things but it's it's inviting people to look at things and and helping people feel that they're um uh that that they're allowed to do that and that they don't need um you know they don't need a, a huge background knowledge in order to do so yeah no, I, I couldn't agree. More. And uh, and I feel like that's a that's a great place to to wrap up because I've actually gone a bit over time. Thank you so much. And it's just yeah, it's been an absolute, an absolute pleasure.